Good morning, friends. Like every year at this time, it's budget time for the church council. We just finished reviewing church finances and next year's proposed budget. This year, with our separation, we have some special challenges to get to the finish line, like our pledge drive. By now, you should have gotten a letter and a pledge card in the mail. Pledges are absolutely critical to our budget forecasting, so I hope you'll take the time to reflect about your own level of support and then complete the card and mail it back. We even stamped your return envelope. Our next budget challenge is getting members approval. We obviously can't meet for a congregational vote like we normally do, so this year we'll do something a little different. The next couple of weeks, you'll receive an email with a summary of the budget. Please review it and email us back your vote on whether to approve. Thank you for continuing to support the values and missions of this church. And one last word. There are lots of questions lately about when we might reopen our church. I wanted you to know that the council and Pastor Sarah have started that planning process. And no, we don't expect it to happen anytime soon. We're still completely focused on following the science and the local COVID trends and focused on the safety of our church family before we settle on a reopening day. But when it does happen, and it will, we want to have a solid plan in place. So we're gathering a small team of members to study the situation. Early next month, they'll start looking at when we can safely reopen and what steps we need to take to minimize the risk when we open those doors, like sanitizing, physical distancing, and even tweaking our fellowship time after service. So stay tuned as we move closer and closer to the time we're finally together again. And let me know if you'd like to be part of that conversation about reopening. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, happy Sunday, and stay safe. Good morning and welcome to Brea Congregational Church. It is such a joy to worship with you this morning. As we come into this virtual space, I invite you to take a deep breath, put aside all the things you need to do, all of the things you can't do, the grief that comes with our current situation. I invite you to center yourself, to take a deep healing breath, allow God to enter your mind and body as we listen to Alice play the prelude.
Good morning. My name is Kip Clemens and I will be the liturgist this morning. Come and worship, people of God. Let us rejoice with songs of praise. For the Spirit is in our midst. And, and we, we gather, gather to, to celebrate God in the here and now. Hello to my young friends at Brea Congregational. I miss you all. I miss seeing you. I love seeing you on Facebook. I miss seeing you in person. I miss high fives and fist bumps and elbow touches and I can't wait till we're back together. And in the meantime, I'm thinking of you all the time. We're talking in uh, our service today about what it means to be eternal. So kind of a big idea. I don't get it. Um, we think of ourselves as finite, like a strip of paper with a beginning and an end. Hopefully a lot of really great things in between, but finite. And so then we sometimes talk about maybe God could give us eternal life, and we have lots of different ways of talking about that, but we think that maybe God is, is not, doesn't have an end, doesn't have a beginning or an end, but is just a circle. But in a circle like this, there's still an inside and an outside, right? There's, there's still parts. It kind of still feels finite in a way. Um, God can help us think differently. God can help us see the world differently. Um, and so we're talking this morning about how when we learn to treat ourselves and each other with respect, to treat the planet with respect, um, that maybe there are new ways of thinking and being and new ways of finding eternity. So I would invite you um, with your parents and teachers to study what a Mobius strip is. Here's my high tech way of showing you what a Mobius strip looks like when it's written down. But if you take a band of paper and you twist it once and then you connect the ends do that right? Nope. I'm too finite. There we go. You can see that if you start on one part of the strip and trace your finger around... Hey, wait. There's not an inside and an outside. There's just one side to this interesting Mobius strip. Well, I say that God can teach us how to have one side, one side that's all love, just like I love you, although different, because it's God. I can't love as good as God can. We try, though. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the example of the love of Jesus. Help us to open our minds and our hearts so that you can teach us how to be eternal. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. this 
this wide world we shall always find those who are crying with no peace of mind but when we help them or when we feed them we belong to God we belong to God Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you those to whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Will you join me in a minute of silent reflection as we listen to our still speaking God? Let us join together in our reflective singing.
Our prayer this morning is an adaptation of a Franciscan benediction. The origins of this prayer are unknown, but as you hear these words, may you draw closer to God in unimagined ways. Will you pray with me? Dear God, today as we gather in community in our own homes, but close together, we lift up those in our circles who are hurting. We lift up those who are facing uncertainty, medical challenges, and those who are grieving. We lift up those who are of special concern in our church community. We pray for Sharon and Bill and for Bob's family. We pray for Robin, Bonnie, Kathy and Teresa and their family, Casey, Linda and Brian, Barbara and Bob, Linda, Maureen, Bernie and Joanne, Sheila, Kent and Josh, Cheryl, and Jackie, and all others who remain close to our heart, but unspoken aloud today. God, we pray that you might bless us with discomfort with the easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. We pray that you will live deep within our hearts. God, we ask you to bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. God, we ask you to bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And today, God, we ask you to bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. And we pray together that prayer from so long ago, the prayer that still brings us life today saying, Our Creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Racing down Hollywood Boulevard at 6.42 p.m. on a weeknight. Why are surface streets always so jammed? Darn it, I knew I should have taken the 101. I hate being late like this and the parking at a movie premiere is always so crazy. Why do people drive so slow? Okay, calm down, calm down. You're here, you're here. Still time. Just check in and get your seat. Shoot, shoot. Where to check in? Uh, A through E? Nope. Um, F through K? Ooh, so close. Oh, L through P? Yes, that's me. Uh, Lewis. Michael Lewis. No, with an E. L-E-W-I-S. Yep, that's me. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Ticket. Nice. Bad seat. Ugh. Okay. Uh, oh, popcorn pass. That's cool. And after party pass. Score. Gotta love the Hollywood movie premiere after party pass. That's where only the in crowd goes in the end. So nice. Having been sheltered at home, first my old Kentucky home, 
haha. Uh -huh. And then my more recent California home for 10 weeks now, I can barely remember what a good old fashioned movie premiere is like. The ones where you actually put clothes on covering your entire body rather than the new waist up zoom uniform. And you go outside and then back inside and you watch a movie. Hopefully you actually watch the movie instead of just cruising the crowd to see who you're gonna talk to at the super cool after party. I'm not just craving a movie theater these days though, I'm craving any human interaction. Living alone, I've turned into an eager dog waiting for the postal delivery person to come because that's now my most intimate physical relationship. I consider myself a very social introvert and all kidding aside, I have to say that safer at home physical distancing is getting really hard for me. Left my own devices and thankfully a freezer full of frozen organic meals, I find myself often with a grapefruit sized throbbing acidic ball in the pit of my stomach that radiates worries like, will this last forever? What's going to happen next? And what if I get sick? Zoom does not replace the loving hugs of dear friends, nor does it accurately depict the twinkle in someone's eye or the care in their voice. I find myself often lonely and fretful. One glimpse of the nightly news, or heaven forbid, what was I thinking, Facebook, and you can kiss a good night of sleep goodbye. At least when I was in Kentucky after my father died in April, my mother and I had our nightly walks and our dinners together. We tried to choose a different route in the neighborhood every night and we would walk and chat and talk about how beautiful the spring trees were. Red buds, tulip trees, and dogwoods showing off in their finest April bling. One afternoon my mom said, let's make a left here. This is the route I took you every day for our walks when you were one and two. I had never known this dear fact, which is now a gift to me from the coronavirus. After our April tree peeping walks, mom and I would make dinner together and eat in front of the TV, watching an episode or two of the Great British Baking Show. Every night as I was getting the TV set up, mom, please stop watching Fox News. Mom would come in and with the food, she would say, let's bless this. I'm not a grace before every meal kind of guy, but this was my mom's house and it was important to her, so I would stop and let her announce her sincere gratitude for the food we'd prepared and the time we'd had together that day. She'd often end her prayer with, and bless Michael and thank you for everything he's doing to help us out, amen. I would add, and God bless Nellie too, amen. I don't say grace before every meal because I think I worry doing so means I think God can change the food by the blessing or that God and not society determines who gets food and who doesn't. By the time I left Louisville and maybe 25 or so blessed meals with my mother, i had been reminded that grace changes people, not things. I eat better in LA knowing that my mom is still praying for me in Kentucky. I make sure I still pray for her too. Bruce Epperly, a leading process theologian, says, Prayer is an active process of aligning our lives with God's vision, discerning our calling, joining with neighbors in common cause, and getting to work. Prayer is essential to activism and inspires us to take creative risks and leave our comfort zones to fulfill our vocation in our time and place. Prayer that aligns our lives, discerns calling, and inspires us to take creative risks is exactly what Jesus is up to in the 17th chapter of John, which is our scripture this morning. The reading is situated in what many consider Jesus' farewell address, or his last discourse, which spans much of the 16th and 17th chapters, dealing first with Jesus' departure and the disciples' future, second with the disciples' life after Jesus is gone, and thirdly, the part we heard read to us today, Jesus' high priestly prayer. When a main character is leaving a story in biblical and other Jewish literature, that character often gives a big farewell speech ending in a prayer. Moses does it in Deuteronomy and Jesus gets his big exit here in John 16 and 17. Like many prayers, and I say this as the guy who often prays on behalf of this congregation, while spoken to God, the purpose of the prayer truly is to align those who overhear it 
with God's spirit and will. God bless Nellie and God bless Michael is really about Nellie and Michael's desires to align with God's spirit and will. So that's what Jesus is up to here in the words of John. And I have the most interest this morning at least in verse 3 where Jesus says, Now this is eternal life, that people may know God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. Period. That's it. There's no footnote saying, well, and also some pearly gates and St. Peter calling the roll up yonder, I'll fly away, a few streets paved with gold and fountains flowing with dark chocolate. That last element is a reference to the Gospel of Michael, if you're not familiar. None of that. Eternal life is that people may know God and Jesus Christ, whom God has sent, full stop. In moments like this, it's easy to get lost in some really interesting theological discussions about what is meant in the text. What does the original Greek say? How has that Greek been translated into English? And I love all of that, and I think it's extremely valuable study. But I also think it's acceptable to start with the basics. If eternal life is to know God and Jesus, well, what does that mean? Well, we know that God is love, which we here at Brea UCC often translate into respect because loving everyone is a very complicated ball of hallmark yarn, but respecting everyone, now that's easier to get our heads around and might really be closer to the heart of the matter anyway. So God is loving respect, let's say, and Jesus Christ, well, when I read a, a scripture that says to believe in Jesus Christ, I translate that for me as to live a life of transformation which honors God's aim of calling life from death, bringing good from bad. So eternal life is loving respect and creative transformation. It reminds me of one of my very favorite scriptures, Matthew 25, 40, that says, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you did it to me. The scripture does not say it's like, or it's as if you did it to me. It says you did it to me. I, God, am this least of experience. I am this outsider, and when you create justice for this outsider, then you are creating justice for me, God the outsider. In the same way, Jesus here says eternal life is knowing and living this call to minister to the least of these. My dear friend Eves Nye is a brilliant thinker and a Jewish chaplain schooled in process thought. She shared with me her thinking on the priestly book of Leviticus from the Hebrew Testament in which God tells all Jews not just the elite priests, but all Jews, to be kadosh, or holy. Written at a time when religion was used as a means of maintaining social hierarchy, Leviticus here, as Eves teaches us, quoting Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Leviticus in its instruction that all Jews should be holy can be seen as the radical democratization of holiness. For me, I might call this the priesthood of all believers. Similarly, I would say that John 17.3 is the democratization of eternal life. It allows each of us, if only for a moment, to come in contact with eternal living. Many of you know how much I love Celtic poet and theologian John O'Donohue. John said this, There is a place in you where you have never been wounded, where there is still a sureness in you, where there's a seamlessness in you and where there is a confidence and tranquility in you. And I think the intention of prayer and spirituality and love is now and again to visit that inner kind of sanctuary. I would say that that quote is describing eternal life, according to John O'Donohue and Gospel of. We encounter that eternal place from time to time, sometimes not recognizing it until it has passed. But the experience of it allows us an easier return, hopefully again and again, until with practice we can claim the eternal as home now. Poet William Blake, with a little gender editing by yours truly, said this, They who bind to themselves a joy do the winged life destroy. They who kiss the joy as it flies live in eternity's sunrise. Before we leave this point, let's revisit democratization. Just like Leviticus offered a democratization of holy, Jesus speaking in John here offers the democratization of eternal life. If eternal life is knowing God in its richest, truest sense, then any of us in any moment ever so fleeting can know God and thus can experience eternal life. 
That includes the person who cuts you off in traffic. Remember traffic? It includes the person who reposts the most inane memes on Facebook, the person who frustrates the living daylights out of you. Each of them might also be experiencing eternal life. So if you can't warm, fuzzy love them, then at least respect them. Just to be clear, you can respect someone and still snooze their posts or even unfriend them. Again, that's the Gospel of Michael. But more seriously, God offers eternal life to each of us in each moment, if and when we claim it by knowing peace through justice and creative transformation. If you can partner with God to pull love and creativity out of a horrible COVID moment, you are touching the eternal. Let's go left here. It's the route I took you on for walks for the first two years of your life. What a blessing. With that blessing comes a responsibility, however. This is what Bruce Epperly referred to as prayer's essence in activism. Just as Matthew 2540 tells us of a time in which we are ministering directly to God the outsider, the fact that we all have equal access to eternal moments demands that we protect each other's access to those moments with the same vigor with which we protect our own. To do otherwise would be to turn away from knowing God and thus forfeit our own access to the eternal. It's a wonderful Mobius strip. As a result, inherent in our ability to fully experience our own eternal moments is the mandate that we work diligently for a world in which the basic needs of all people are met equally and justly such that all are freed from the temporal needs of our time into a space where each living creature has equal and free access to the eternal. Struggle cannot stop the eternal, but it certainly can make its experience more difficult. When my friend Barbara Mesley sent me a link to that version of My Life Flows On in Endless Song that I posted, and I clicked on it, I was caught off guard by its beauty and its power. From houses and apartments, condos and lofts all over New York, the Grace Chorale of Brooklyn brought people together to make incredible music. These were people more likely than not who would have greatly preferred to be all in the same hall for this performance, but right now that wasn't wise or even possible. But music is bigger than a virus, and so they figured it out. Four hands for piano start out joined by vocalists and instrumentalists, woven together by gifted technicians. The voices swell, then strings and horns join, percussion, electric guitar, and reeds. At one point, the instruments all rest, and a full chorus of a cappella voices take off. It brings my heart rate up and tears to my eyes every time. The power of the singer, the human instrument making gorgeous sound. In this instance, the sound of praise. The cooperation and artistry, the power, the creativity, melody and harmony and accompaniment, beauty sails above any worry or fear anyone could imagine. In that moment, we are released simply to fly. In listening to this amazing work, I feel connected to the most powerful forces I know. I rest in the softness of that moment like a feather carried along by a pure spring breeze. I feel connected and supported and loved. How could there be greater life eternal? And indeed, how could any of us keep from singing? My friend Cecilia Beeler shared an Ansel Adams quote with me this week in which the artist says, We all move on the fringes of eternity and are sometimes granted vistas through fabric of illusion. For me, the beauty of the music from that virtual orchestra and chorale called into focus the fact of how thin that fabric sometimes is and how we can so easily gain a vista on eternity when our hearts and minds are open. In the coming days and weeks, we no doubt face further struggle and challenge. Whenever you feel separate or alone, worried or afraid, my prayer is that you will remember this. God is with you in each moment. God offers to you in each moment an opportunity to touch a steady, timeless goodness, to recenter yourself around that goodness and to become steady yourself. In the moment of the eternal, as the hymn says, no storm can shake your inmost calm 
while to that rock you're clinging. It sounds and echoes in your soul. How can you keep from singing? Lift up your voice in song, in science, in love, in protest. Demand that black and brown people have health care every bit as good as white people. Demand that the government honors data, not dollars, and prioritizes health over wealth. Reach out, reach up, reach deep within to that place in you that has never been wounded and pull out of it the creativity and compassion that will save the entire world or at least will save your world and the world of one other living being. Hold your cat in your lap. Tickle your dog's tummy. Heck, tickle your partner's tummy. Make the Buddha laugh. Embrace being alone, knowing that God is never gone and goodness is never further away than the choice born on the wings of every moment. Kiss the joy as it flies and wish for every person in our diverse and welcoming family the well-being that comes only from living in God's beautiful, eternal, precious, loving now. May it be so. Amen. Hello, church. It's Jessica. I'm here to introduce the song for this week. Uh, it's a fairly different kind of song. It is called Afterlife by the band Switchfoot that is based in San Diego, California. If you're not, oh, uh, if you're not familiar with the band, they formed in 1997 and I've been listening to them since about junior high, high school time. They are a Christian rock band, but they're not a Christian rock band. One of the things that they do really well is write songs that can also appeal to secular audiences and have good messages, but in a secular way, just depending on how you listen to the song. So this song is called Afterlife. It is from their 2011 album called Vice Versus. If you're interested, you can go ahead and check out their music. It is quite different than what I've put together because I am not a rock musician. Um, I thought the song, the text went really well, but I was, kind of racking my brain trying to figure out how I was going to make this song happen without a band and rock music. I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you! I've tasted fire, I'm ready to come alive. I can't just shut it up and fake that I'm alright. I'm ready now, I'm not waiting for the afterlife I let it burn the way the sunlight burns my skin The way I feel inside, the way the day begins I'm ready now, I'm not waiting for the other side I still believe we can live forever You and I, we begin forever now Forever now Forever I still believe in us together You and I, we are here together now Forever now Forever now Or never now Cause every day The world is made chance to change but I feel the same and I wonder why would I wait till I die to come alive I'm ready now I'm not waiting for the afterlife choice.
As we depart worship, please join me in our responsive commission and blessing. As people of faith, we have gathered for worship. As, As people, people of faith, faith we, we now return, return to, to the, the world. world. Go out to share the story of faith, the story of life with the world around you. We, we share, share the, the faith, faith in word and in deed, in speech and in action. action. As you go out to give a living witness, as you go out to testify to God's love, active in the world. Go, knowing that God goes with you, sharing the laughter and the hope, the fears and the tears. Thanks be to God. Amen. When all of this is over, I look forward to going to the movies again, and maybe even a premiere. I don't care if there's an after party because I know I'm going to love the film. May God through Christ inspire each of us to trust in the divine presence and to bring the eternal goodness into each delicious moment. Be peace. Amen. Thank you.